Through the history of Apollo, some of the most important steps have been forgotten or treated as routine, when in actuality, without these steps, the landing could never have happened. One such step is an Apollo mission that never left Earth orbit, Apollo 9, a mission that would tackle the most important question of all. Just how do you get to the moon? What would be the requirements and techniques for such a journey to be accomplished safely and at a bare minimum of cost? That question goes back to the very beginning. In 1961, leading rocket scientist Werner von Braun, a man who is considered to be the father of modern rocketry, had proposed the two best methods for reaching the moon. The first was the simplest, direct ascent. Essentially building a large rocket, firing straight to the moon, landing with it, and returning to Earth with it. Simple, yet ultimately the most impractical, as the sheer size and power a rocket would require to lift such a vehicle would ensure that America would lose a time-critical race to the Soviets, whom had already demonstrated themselves superior in heavy lifting capabilities. The second proposed method was called Earth Orbit Rendezvous. Instead of building one huge rocket, the spacecraft would be launched in pieces, utilizing smaller launch vehicles and assembled in orbit. The combined spacecraft would then continue its trek toward the moon and land on its surface. While this did have the advantage of requiring less power and size to reach orbit, it would prove to be a more costly procedure. And there was still one big problem with both plans, the size of the lander which would end up being 60 feet tall and a couple hundred tons at least. Now, many crazy ideas were pitched during this time from other engineers, NASA staff members, or people with flashes of inspiration brought upon by slipping on a wet toilet and hitting their head on a sink while hanging a clock in the bathroom. Suffice to say, it seemed clear that either direct ascent or Earth orbit rendezvous was the only feasible way to go. The first man to seriously speak against these ideas was Tom Dolan, an engineer for Chancevat Industries. He had remembered a Ukrainian engineer in 1916 by the name of Yuri Kondratyuk, as well as Hermann Oberth in 1923, both of whom had stated the most important factor in reaching the moon was weight. To this, Dolan had written a proposal which he called Manned Lunar Landing and Return otherwise known as Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. Instead of sending a massive craft to the surface, the Apollo Command Module would be accompanied by a small, lightweight craft, built only to be used in the vacuum of space, with just enough fuel to make it to and from the lunar surface. Dolan offered a draft of his proposal to NASA, but would get the standard polite brush-off response. Defeated, Dolan simply returned to work, abandoning his idea and assuming it would fade into obscurity. Fortunately, a copy of this proposal had been discovered by John Hubbolt, an engineer at the Langley Research Center. At first glance, it appeared to be just another crazy idea, but as Hubbolt continued to read, the idea seemed to make more and more sense. Finally, with the turn of the final page, Hubbolt knew beyond all doubt that this was how you get to the moon. Throughout 1961, Hubble would champion the idea of lunar orbit rendezvous, showing it to anyone who would listen. Co-workers, engineers, designers, dreamers, and every supervisor and manager above him. Yet, just like Dolan, nobody would take his idea seriously. Other men at this time fought for the idea too, but it would take a tremendous sacrifice to get the idea heard. Finally, Hubble decided to roll the dice and stake his career on the idea, circumventing the chain of command and writing directly to Associate NASA Administrator Robert Siemens. This was a tremendous risk, as stepping on the toes of his bosses could have easily gotten Hubble fired, and he knew this. In his letter, to which he referred to himself as somewhat a voice in the wilderness, Hubble had basically challenged Siemens with the question, do we want to go to the moon or not? His letter continues, Why is NOVA, the proposed direct ascent launch vehicle at the time, 
with its ponderous size simply accepted? And why is a much less grandiose scheme involving rendezvous ostracized or put on the defensive? I fully recognize that contacting you in this manner is somewhat unorthodox, but the issues at stake are crucial enough to us all that an unusual course was warranted. He included a 40-page report on lunar orbit rendezvous, to which Siemens had initially greeted with skepticism, and yet his own experience in satellite development had allowed him to see the benefits of such a plan. Also, some new faces in NASA administration took to the idea with open minds, including Dr. Joseph Shea, Deputy Director of Systems at the Office of Manned Spaceflight. Over the course of the year, direct ascent and Earth orbit rendezvous began to show their unreliability, namely because the development time and cost that the ultra-massive Nova rocket would require, as well as the technical feasibility of maneuvering such a large lander to a soft landing on the lunar surface, especially within Kennedy's deadline of the end of the decade. Finally, the dark horse in the room became the front runner, and with the endorsements of Werner von Braun and NASA Administrator James Webb, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous would be approved in July 1962. The contract for design, construction, and testing would be awarded to Grumman Aircraft Engineering, later known as Northrop Grumman, with aerospace engineer Tom Kelly in charge of the project. Getting the contract was the easy part, now, Grumman has to design the lander. The only requirements involve vertical landing, capability of supporting two men for two days, and above all, weight. Initially, the design looked like a smaller version of the Apollo Command and Service modules, a cone-shaped module at the top of a cylindrical module with unfolding legs. The first problem was visibility, as this design had astronauts on their back the whole trip. To correct this issue, the first redesign was inspired by helicopters of the day, with large curved windows on the forward end and astronauts seated, giving them a wide view of the surface to more adequately facilitate a hover approach and landing. Right away, weight became a factor. These massive windows and the support structure around them would add around 700 pounds. This had to be fixed but there were no lighter weight transparent materials that would do the job, and certainly the windows couldn't be made any smaller, otherwise the astronauts wouldn't be able to see from their seats. Tackling this conundrum, one of the designers pitched to Tom Kelly an interesting idea. What if they don't need seats? With gravity only one-sixth that of Earth, astronauts' legs could easily take the shock of a landing at the required touchdown speeds. This way, the astronauts would be closer to the window, and could therefore accomplish the same job with much smaller windows on either side. Also, by removing the seats, even more weight was spared, as well as crew space inside the cabin. Well, they weren't done yet, because it was still far too heavy. Initially, there were two docking ports, one up top for the initial flight into lunar orbit, and the other in front for rendezvous after leaving the lunar surface. These hatches were particularly heavy, and they had to lock the two spacecraft together and maintain an atmospheric seal between them. For this, the forward hatch was replaced with a standard hatch, used only for exiting and entering the craft on the lunar surface. Responsibility for a docking approach would instead fall to the command module, adding only a small window above the commander's position so he could look up and observe the approach. But overall, the most important weight-saving feature involved the engines. It is commonly known that for each pound of mass, you must add four times that weight in fuel. Naturally, the main engine would be on the module that the legs were attached to, but once on the surface, the legs serve no purpose on return. The first idea was to have the engine module independent of the legs, and simply slip out through the middle. But this still requires the same engine and fuel tanks from descent. Instead, the craft was broken up into two separate craft. The descent stage, with the legs, landing engine, and equipment for surface experiments. And the ascent stage, containing the crew cabin, life support, and a smaller engine. 
With the decent engines, spent tanks, and leg module left behind, the returning craft was far lighter, approximately a third the weight of the initial lander. This requires far less thrust, and therefore far less fuel, and in turn, far less weight in the overall design. The unfortunate trade-off was this added a bit of complexity, something Grumman would later discover when it came time to build them. As construction began, a couple changes were made almost immediately. First, the name Lunar Excursion Module, otherwise known as LEM. George Lowe, manager of the Apollo Spacecraft Production Office, ordered the word excursion to be removed from the name, not wanting a frivolous opinion of the program. Now simply called the Lunar Module, the abbreviation would change from LEM to simply LM. But pronunciation did not change, as some felt it was still far easier to refer to the craft as LEM. The second decision came from Tom Kelly at Grumman for the team to film everything they did during construction phases. This was primarily to ensure that none of the money provided to them was being wasted, and every aspect of construction and every dollar spent would be accounted for, but also if things went wrong, they had a visual record of where it occurred. But this didn't prevent the construction from going behind schedule and over budget, because it did. Every piece of the lunar module had to be handmade and designed from scratch. There was no supplier to order new or replacement parts, as there was never a vehicle like it before. Everything had to be tested, retested, and tested again. Thousands upon thousands of tests every day for years. Compounding cost and time was the fact that several lunar modules would be required. LEM 1 and 2 would be used for unmanned test flights, while LEM 3 would be the first to be flown in space by astronauts. The Grumman team worked closely with the astronauts since the very beginning of the LEM program, and in November 1966, NASA would announce who would be the first to fly it. Commander Jim McDivitt, veteran of Gemini 4, and widely considered to be one of, if not the, best pilot in the program. Command module pilot David Scott, veteran of Gemini 8, America's first docking in space. And lunar module pilot Rusty Schweikart, a rookie from NASA's third class of astronauts. These men would pay special close attention to LEM-3 for the next two years, marveling at just how many space firsts would be required in their mission plan. But before any of that could happen, the LEM has to fly, getting the thousands of systems and subsystems to work together as one. In a quarter million mile trip, everything has to work perfectly, as the slightest malfunction could conceivably cost the lives of the crew, and the astronauts knew that. Beyond the operation of the spacecraft itself, another aspect that had to work perfectly was the descent to the surface. NASA would contract Bell Aerosystems in 1964 to construct a special training vehicle designed specifically to familiarize astronauts with the vertical approach and landings. This vehicle, officially named the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle, was often jokingly referred to as the Flying Bedstead. Built with a gimbal-mounted vertical jet engine, delivering sufficient thrust to counter 5 6 of the Earth's gravity and simulate lunar conditions. It was a very tricky and unstable machine, however. It did not simulate any aspect of the actual mission, but instead helped familiarize astronauts with vertical landings with their own fanny hanging out there. Fortunately, Bell had the foresight of installing rocket-powered ejection seats, as three of the five constructed LLRVs would crash, and yet all three men involved survived the incident. While training in the LLRV was beneficial, landing in the Earth's atmosphere was a completely different animal than landing in an airless vacuum, and the astronauts had focused their training on standard computer-assisted simulators. While the astronauts were facing their own training challenges, Grumman was running out of time, falling almost a year behind schedule and reaching twice the original budget. The first unmanned test flight utilizing LEM-1 was originally scheduled for April 1967. Production delays pushed this test all the way back to January 1968, 
and things were just as bad for Lem 3. A big reason for this is often attributed to the fact that production schedules and budgets are based on previous experience with similar projects. And as a project of this magnitude had never been attempted before, the estimates were little more than guesses. All that was known was the time they had, and it was running out fast. In order to make the deadline for the scheduled Apollo 8 mission, LEM-3 had to be delivered to NASA in early spring of 1968, and despite working 24-hour rotations seven days a week, LEM-3 would just not be ready in time. In June, the decision came to ship LEM-3 to NASA as is and finish work at the Cape, and it still wasn't enough. With all the delays, despite round-the-clock construction, Apollo 8 could not fly until spring of 1969, leaving only nine months at best to complete four missions and land on its surface. This would prove an impossible feat until George Lowe proposed the idea of swapping missions. Instead of waiting for the successful lunar module test in Earth orbit, Apollo 8 was retasked to fly all the way to the moon with just the command service module. This would eliminate one mission after LEM-3's flight, and possibly even two, advancing the timeline and still granting the extra time that Grumman so desperately needed. Not wanting to lose McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikert's experience with the LEM, Apollo 8 was handed off to the following crew, Borman, Lovell, and Anders, originally scheduled to fly LEM-4 into lunar orbit, leaving LEM-3's crew to Apollo 9. Apollo 8 would make its historic lunar orbit in December of 1968, all the while work continued feverishly on LEM-3. Finally in February, the Grumman team had verified that every circuit was tested, every bolt tightened, and every concern addressed. LEM-3 was complete and ready to fly. For the first time since Mercury, call signs would be given to the spacecraft primarily to differentiate between the command and lunar modules in flight. The LEM would be given an appropriate nickname, Spider, and the command module, funny enough, would be called Gumdrop. Schweikart's rationale for this was that when the CM was delivered from North American, it was wrapped in blue plastic and looked like the candy its name had suggested. Spider was mated to the Saturn 4B booster stage and encased in its protective shroud attached to the back of Gumdrop's service module. Together, they waited as the completed vehicle slowly transported to the launch platform. Finally, on March 3, 1969, McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikart would be strapped into the spacecraft, and beneath them, LEM-3 waited in peaceful silence. That is, until the engines ignited. For 10 minutes, the sleeping spacecraft would feel the power of the mighty Saturn rocket, as if sitting through an earthquake that would never end. Apollo 9 would reach orbit without incident, but that wasn't the big story for Tom Kelly and the rest of the Grumman team. Before launch, the pressure in one of the helium tanks in Spider's descent stage was reading disturbingly high. It was not quite at abort limits, but it was far from nominal readings that they'd hoped for. Tom Kelly continued to watch the pressure readouts like a hawk, yet insisting to NASA that the tank would hold. Once in orbit, Gumdrop would separate from the S-4B booster stage, the protective fairings falling away, and Spider would be revealed nestled safely inside. Gumdrop begins to pitch over turning around to face the separated stage that used to be attached to the back end, and the three men would get their first glimpse of their companion spacecraft. Making a slow approach in a rendezvous maneuver that had been accomplished so many times in Gemini, a familiar event for Command Module Pilot David Scott, the docking probe nestles into Spider's docking hatch, and the two craft come together, safe and secure. After docking, the remainder of the first day would consist of readying the lunar module for entry. The first task, pressurize the tunnel between the two craft. Once done, remove the hatch at the command module's nose and stow it away inside the cabin. 
McDivitt inspects the 12 latches to ensure a proper seal between the two craft, followed by the docking drogue and spider's topside, finding no significant signs of impacts or scratches from the docking phase. About an hour later, in the first of many spaceflight firsts on Apollo 9, Gumdrop would reverse thrust and pull Spider free from its carrier in the first docking extraction of a spacecraft. Before the lunar module could be entered, Apollo 9 would need to test the service module engine, ensuring that it could properly work with the lunar module attached, all previous burns being of the command module alone. The first was a short burn of 5 seconds just to test the basic capability, but further engine tests of increasing length would test gimbling of the SPS engine, as well as the autopilot's ability to correct the craft's orientation. The third first would occur when Rusty Schweikart would open the hatches connecting the two spacecraft and become the first man in history to internally transfer from one spacecraft to another. He would move to the right side position and turn on LEM-3's batteries and ready the craft for her maiden voyage followed shortly by McDivitt, who would take the left-hand position. The two men would ensure everything was in working order and extend the landing gear into position, ensuring Spider was ready to separate and fly alone. This did not happen. Before systems checks were completed, another astronaut succumbs to space adaptation syndrome, and Schweikart began to vomit in the spacecraft. The vomit itself was not the concern. Before separation could take place, an emergency test had to be accomplished. Schweikart would be required to be sealed into a pressure suit and test the Personal Life Support System, or PLIS, backpack, testing if an astronaut could safely transfer outside the spacecraft without umbilical connections. This also, of course, to test the capability of the backpack for lunar landings. McDivitt had ordered the EVA to be scrubbed, choosing not to risk Schweikart's life should he vomit again while outside the spacecraft. But without the EVA, mission rules would come to effect, and LEM-3 could not have its manned test flight. The Grumman team understood that Rusty's life was the number one concern, and would not question McDivitt's decision to cancel the EVA, yet still, they were devastated. LEM-3 would not fly. The next day, the two men would test everything they could, accomplishing as many objectives as possible with the two craft connected. The mood around mission control was fairly grim, though, as canceling LEM-3's test flight put future missions at risk and could potentially spell disaster for reaching Kennedy's goal of landing on the moon before the end of the decade. The biggest fear was that if this goal could not be met, public sentiment would evaporate and all future funding would disappear along with it. After spending a day to adjust to weightlessness, Schweikart had seemed to recover, offering no signs of nausea or discomfort, even going so far as to say that he was feeling really good. With a smile on his face, McDivitt calls up to Dave Scott and Gumdrop and says they should let Rusty step out onto the porch to get some fresh air. All three men seal themselves into their suits and depressurize both spacecraft. While Rusty steps out onto LEM-3's porch, Dave Scott opens the command module's hatch and films his test of the Pliss backpack, another pair of firsts in spaceflight. But when Dave's camera had failed, he stepped back in to repair it. Schweikart would experience a first that was not on the schedule something that had never occurred in an EVA. Free time. For three minutes, there was nothing for him to do but look at the Earth as it slowly rotated beneath him. These three minutes must have seemed like the longest three minutes of his life, but not out of boredom. Much like Ed White on Gemini 4, Schweikart would recall this moment of quiet observation as one of the greatest experiences of his life taking in the majestic beauty below. After the tests were concluded, Dave and Rusty step back into their craft and close the hatches, repressurizing the combined cabin.
After sealing the hatches between the two, Lem-3 would undock, and Spider and Gumdrop would find themselves separated once again. Now it was time to see if Tom Kelly had made the right decision, with another of Apollo 9's space firsts, the first test of a manned lunar module. Leaving Scott alone in the command module may not have been a first in space flight, but it was still a first for Apollo. Kelly watches the pressure gauges closely as McDivitt throttles up Spider's descent stage, Scott watching from Gumdrop's window. As the engine throttled up to 20%, McDivitt mentions that it feels a little rough, implying that the helium mix may have been a little off. He ignites the engine one more time, throttling up to 40%, and as Tom Kelly anxiously awaits, he would finally call back down that it was a good burn. The helium tank held. Spider would fly out to 110 miles from Gumdrop, then turn around, cut the descent stage loose, and in another first, light the ascent stage engine to re-rendezvous with Gumdrop. Looking out the window, Schweikart comments, and there goes half our spacecraft. A short time later, Lem-3 redocks with the command module, turning Apollo 9 into a singular craft once again. Jim and Rusty close out the remaining procedures and shut down the LEM before returning to the command module, sealing up the hatch and tunnel connections and sending Spider on its final flight all alone. The three men say their goodbyes as Spider is separated, left to drift away, her mission completed, and her crew returning safe. After testing the service module's SPS engine a few times for the remaining few days of the mission, one final burn would send Apollo 9 back into the atmosphere for re-entry. LEM-3 would continue to orbit, remaining there until finally re-entering the atmosphere in 1981. Apollo 9 had shown that a LEM could fly, and paved the way for the moment that would fundamentally change the perception of what humankind could accomplish when LEM-5 would make her way to the Sea of Tranquility two missions later. A triumphant achievement all made possible because of this week in space history.